Welcome to the Untold Tales Audio Anthologies, written by Dr. Jeffrey A. Robinson and narrated by Melissa Del Toro Schaffner. Dream Time Despite the 30 hours I had spent on board airplanes and waiting in airports, I felt quite wide awake and alert as I arrived at the Canberra Hospital in New South Wales, Australia. While well after midnight, my biological clock insisted it was mid-afternoon, and it would likely be days before jet lag wore off enough for me to adjust to local time. The dark parking lot was empty and deserted. The hospital lobby was similarly devoid of people, and there was no attendant at the registration desk. Peeking around a corner behind the admissions desk, I spied a nurse drinking coffee at a small table in the next room, reading a magazine. Feigning a cough to attract her attention, I backed out making my way around to the front desk as she approached me with a glare. Can I help you, sir? She said. Visiting hours are long over. Positioning myself on the correct side of the counter, I dug into my suit coat for my identification. My name is Dr. Robert Crawford, and I've just arrived to see my brother, James Crawford. I showed her my passport, but she waved it away. It's all right, she said. This is a hospital, not a custom station. I don't need to see your papers. Flinching, I put my ID away. Presenting my passport had become a habit with all the security checks and connections I'd passed through since leaving New York. With layovers in Dallas, Los Angeles, and Sydney, I felt like I'd been traveling for days. The admissions nurse turned away from me and typed something into the computer keyboard next to her at the counter. Let's see. Crawford James, she said. Third floor, room 382. I'm sorry, though, visiting hours aren't until 8 a.m. You'll have to come back in the morning. Gritting my teeth and fighting back the first half dozen responses that came to mind, I said, Excuse me, but I've just flown over 10,000 miles to see my brother and only arrived at the local airport a few minutes ago. I haven't even checked into a hotel yet because I was told to get here as soon as possible. All I was told was that he's dying. Look, I'm a doctor myself. I specialize in gastroenterology at Good Samaritan Hospital in New York. Are you sure I can at least get some information on his condition? The nurse frowned and started to speak, but looked up at the wall clock instead and her demeanor softened. After a moment of indecision, she said, Go on up. The elevators are around the corner to your right. I'll phone the charge nurse upstairs and tell her you're coming. Mumbling thanks, I hurried to the elevators, hoping to get out of sight before she changed her mind. After a delay so long that I had begun to think the elevator wasn't in service, the elevator doors opened up to admit me. Climbing with agonizing slowness, I started to feel weariness grow upon me as a dim fluorescent light flickered annoyingly overhead and scratchy music droned from speakers nearby. When the doors finally opened, I stepped out and almost ran over a nurse directly in my path. Smiling, she extended her hand in greeting. Dr. Crawford, I presume. Uh, yes, I replied, shaking her hand. I'm Dr. Janet Wilkes, and I've been handling your brother's case. I hesitated and blushed briefly, embarrassed that I'd assumed she was a nurse. Recovering, I released her hand, embarrassed once again. I'm glad you were able to get here so quickly, she said. You must have had a long trip. You were right to come straight up. Your brother isn't doing well, and he may not last the night. What happened? I asked. The message I got in New York was cryptic. It only said he was dying. She crossed her hands in front of her and sighed. Your brother James was transferred to us from a regional hospital north of Cooper Pedy in South Australia. A lorry driver found him staggering along a deserted road in the outback and took him to a nearby clinic. Your brother lost consciousness before he arrived, so they couldn't question him. But at first, they thought he might have been bitten or stung by something poisonous. He was covered with mud and filth when he was brought in, and it took quite a while to clean him up and examine him. Unfortunately, even though he had numerous deep cuts and abrasions, they couldn't locate a bite or a puncture site, so they didn't administer any antitoxin. The staff watched him for a day, documenting his symptoms, but when his condition worsened, they sent him here. We have one of the best toxicological facilities in the country. 
So what's wrong with him? I asked. He's suffering from high fever and an infection of unidentified origin. We haven't identified any treatable toxicological ailment, but his condition has continued to deteriorate. We've administered high doses of broadband antibiotics, but nothing's proved effective. His fever is still dangerously high, and he's grown weaker. If he weren't in such good physical condition, he'd probably be dead by now. Damn it, Jimmy, I thought. Everyone's always told you that if you kept chasing danger like a roughneck, you'd get yourself killed someday. I grimaced at the news. James wrote periodically about his adventures down here. Once he mentioned that Australia had more poisonous insects and snakes than any other continent. I think that was part of the thrill of being here. The doctor nodded. Unfortunately, that's true, but we only carry antidotes for a fraction of the poisonous species— Ironically, some of the antitoxins are as deadly as the venoms they treat, and we can't administer them unless we know exactly what toxin is involved. Isn't there anything you can do? I asked. Not really, she said. We're not even sure anymore that he's been poisoned. He has several nasty cuts, which have become infected. There's one particularly bad wound on his arm that may have caused him to go into toxic shock. It's turned septic and we've left it open to drain. More importantly, his body is currently fighting off something that's ravaging his system, and with his failure to respond to antibiotics, we suspect it's viral in nature. Well, can't you treat him with antivirals? I asked. Dr. Wilkes shrugged. Again, we'd have to know what type of virus. Wide-spectrum antivirals are nearly as hard on patients as the diseases they treat. Besides, His condition's far too weak to handle any of them. If we administered any as you suggest, we'd probably kill him. All we can do now is give him massive injections of gamma globulin to boost what's left in his immune system and try to manage his temperature. How long has he been here? James arrived here three days ago. He was at the Cooper PD Regional Medical Center for a day before they transferred him here. When we realized his condition was deteriorating, we contacted the authorities and, since you were listed as next of kin on his immigration papers, we notified you. Thanks, I said. James and I had been quite close as boys, but we'd grown distant over the years. I'd gone on to medical school and started my residency in New York, while he'd gone off adventuring. Jimmy was just the kid brother who never grew up. Even at 28, he'd never settled down held a steady job, or had a long-term relationship. He always promised to visit the folks at Christmas, but all we ever got were postcards and pictures from exotic locations around the world. The last the family had heard from him, he'd gone gallivanting down here to Australia and had deliberately adopted the mannerisms of Diamond Jim Ladlow, an entrepreneur and gambler of the Gold Coast in the heyday of the 1850s gold rush. All the most recent pictures of James portrayed him wearing the white hat, white coat, and the gold inlaid wooden cane of his new hero. But now, he was dying. Can I see him? I asked. Sure, replied the doctor. It's time to check on him anyway. Has he regained consciousness at all? Oh, he comes around from time to time, but he's usually delirious. I'm not sure he knows where he is or how bad his situation is. If he's awake, don't get him too distressed. She turned and escorted me down the hall. With the corridor lights dimmed and room lights off, it was hauntingly quiet, reminiscent of walking the length of the large morgue in the hospital in New York, where I worked. The side rooms were all dark, and it was impossible to tell if patients resided in any of them. If there were patients, they were all sound asleep. We turned a corner and I spied the charge nurse, working on charts. She glanced up and returned to her work without acknowledging either of us. At last we came to a dimly lit room with a single bed, an emotionless occupant with a pallid complexion. Dr. Wilkes gestured for me to enter and reached over to the wall and brightened the light incrementally. Then she waited silently at the door behind me. I nearly gasped when I saw Jimmy. I wouldn't have recognized him. His face was drawn and gaunt. Whatever his illness, 
It had sculpted deep black circles beneath his eyes, and he gasped weakly for each shallow breath. Jimmy seemed far too old and frail to be the vibrant younger brother that I remembered. Taking a seat in a chair by his bedside, I reached out and grasped his hand. It was dry and hot, limp and unresponsive. Glancing back at the doctor with an unspoken query, Dr. Wilkes nodded softly in a silent reply. Jimmy, I said. Jimmy, can you hear me? I felt a feeble squeeze of his fingers and his head turned marginally. His eyelids opened a fraction and red-rimmed eyes peered out at me. Rob, is that you, Rob? He whispered. Holding his hand firmly, I leaned close. Yes, Jimmy, it's me. I'm here. He sighed. Good. I was just dreaming about you. I wanted to talk to you, and, and now you're here. Chuckling weakly, he coughed and struggled for breath. How are you doing? I asked. Can you hang on a little longer for me? He smiled feebly. No problem, Rob. That's what I do best. I always hang on. I never let go. With that, he squeezed my hand with unexpected ferocity, with a grip that was hard and strong. As young boys, we had always competed with each other, comparing the strengths of our grips. However, despite being two years younger than me, James had always managed to outmuscle me and made me cry uncle first. Tears welled in my eyes, and I felt a surge of hope that he'd be all right. But his vice-like grip slowly faded until his hand lay limp once more in my own. Closing his eyes, he sighed and rested quietly for a moment. Jimmy, what happened? I asked. Where were you? For a second, I wasn't sure he heard me. I wasn't sure that he could. Then he opened his eyes and peeked at me again. I found it, Rob. I heard about it years ago, but everybody else thought it was just a story. What did you find, Jimmy? The secret of Chikorpa, the Aborigine dream time. James struggled to turn toward me half rolling on his side to face me, but he failed and collapsed back onto his pillow, gasping from the effort. Closing his eyes once more, he slowly explained. Three years ago, I met an aborigine named Udnadatta. He told me all the exotic aborigine myths and stories that tourists pay to hear. He wove tall tales of the ancient Anangu aborigines, but when he was finished, I didn't go away. I asked him to tell me more. It took months, but eventually he told me secrets, rarely shared with outsiders. Udnadatta told me about how their heroes became dreamwalkers. To him, this was no tale. It was sacred mystery. James' breathing grew shallow and soft. It seemed as though he might have fallen asleep in mid-sentence, but after a few moments he inhaled deeply and continued. My friend said a shaman lived in a cave near Kantchu Gorge, south of the holy rock Uluru. The shaman was reportedly thousands of years old, and he periodically revealed the secrets about dream time to their high priests and warriors. Those gifted with the ability to dream walk became immortals and heroes to the local tribes. That's what I went looking for, Rob. The secret of immortality. Oh my God, I thought. He's gone and killed himself looking for the local fountain of youth? Poor Jimmy's wasted his life searching for a cure for a midlife crisis. Rob, listen, he insisted. It's true. James turned his head and his eyes grew wide. His inflamed bloodshot eyes pleaded urgently for me to believe. It took me months to find the cave. 
I thought I'd have to search every damned crevice in a hundred square miles of rocky cliffs, but I found it. The cave was half hidden by a rock slide, and the entrance was barely wide enough to squeeze through, but inside there was a huge complex of caverns. Even then, Rob, I had to go back over and over again. You see, the shaman only appears when there's a full moon, and he only shows up for a few minutes precisely at midnight. It has to be a night, you know, because the caves are full of bats and you can only enter safely when most of them are out feeding. Still, there are plenty left behind to defend their cave. Chuckling once more, he wrinkled his nose. Would you believe I had to rub bat guano all over myself so the bats wouldn't attack me? The smell was so bad, I had to plug my nose and breathe through my mouth or I'd gag. Turning my head toward Dr. Wilkes, I raised my eyebrows in another silent query. She shrugged. It would explain the numerous cuts and infections. The hospital staff at Cooper PD did report he was covered in filth. That part of his story may be true. Go on, Jimmy, I said. What happened then? James coughed. The shaman, an ancient priest named Warum Wadu, appeared in the back of the grotto in the center of the cave complex. I swear, he just materialized out of thin air. One moment, no one was there. The next, he was squatting on a ledge overhead, staring down at me. When I got over the shock of his presence, I explained why I'd come, but he didn't reply. He listened like he understood but wouldn't respond. I repeated my request and pleaded. Soon I bargained and demanded, but the shaman continued to stare at me like I was an inanimate curiosity. Finally, I got angry and threatened to come back with explosives and blow up his cave if he didn't give me his secret. James laughed weakly. Frankly, Rob, I, I decided he didn't understand English. But he must have because he jumped off his rock and approached me. His face was painted and streaked with gray ash. His hair was wild and ragged, but his skin was the darkest black of any aborigine I've ever seen. All he wore was a loincloth, and his only possession was a long, thin spear with a shiny black stone at one end. He approached like he was studying me. His, his eyes narrowed as he leaned close, and he sniffed at me. I didn't move. I was afraid. I simply didn't know what he was going to do next. James paused and took a few shallow gasps before proceeding. Even this short conversation was a great strain on him. I thought he might attack, but the shaman just smiled. Then, with complete calm, he lowered his spear and drew the black spearhead across his palm. Sucking in a deep breath, James said, Rob, that spearhead must have been as sharp as a razor because it cut his hand all the way to the bone. I watched in horror as blood poured from his hand to the ground, but... The little guy kept on smiling like nothing had happened. Then, before I could react, he whipped his spear forward and cut my arm. Jimmy reached over with his right hand and touched the gauze on his left forearm. Here, I'll show you, he said. Without hesitation, James hooked a finger under the dressing above where I held his hand and pulled it back. It was an ugly wound. The gash was at least eight inches long and two inches deep. His forearm was cut lengthwise from elbow to wrist, and the open wound was badly abscessed. The infection was severe, and the arm was red and swollen to nearly twice its normal size. The doctor swore under her breath and hastened to his side. I told you we have to leave it open so it can drain, but it must be kept covered. 
Glaring at me, she reapplied the dressing, but James didn't resist her efforts to tape the gauze back down. He simply smiled, and when she was finished, he continued the story. Anyway, when the shaman cut me, I jumped backwards in shock and pain. But the damn little guy was faster than you'd believe. Before I could move away, he grabbed me with his hand, the one he'd cut, and held me by my arm. God, it hurt. I screamed and tried to pull away, but he wouldn't let go. His grip was incredible. I thought he was going to rip my arm off. I fought to get away. I screamed at him and hit him. But for a little guy, he was pretty tough. He never flinched, even though I must have struck him more than a dozen times. At last, I stopped struggling, and he smiled. Slowly, very slowly, he relaxed his grip, and blood from both our wounds began to drip through his fingers. He held me there for several minutes, fixed by his icy eyes and his iron grasp. Finally, he let me go and stepped back. I, I grabbed my arm and tried to apply direct pressure to stop the bleeding. The little fellow, however, simply jumped back up to his ledge. When he was crouched down again, he shouted something and flung his hand up at the roof of the cave, spraying blood all over the bats on the ceiling. They scattered in a frenzy of activity. Then he held his hand up before me and slowly made a fist. I nursed my own arm, wondering what the little guy was up to. After maybe a minute, he carefully opened his fingers and revealed his hand. Horror radiated from James' eyes. Rob, I, I swear there was, there was blood everywhere, but the cut on his hand was gone. His palm was smooth and unmarked as a newborn baby's. I gaped in awe and examined my own wound. Blood dripped and continued to seep through my fingers, pooling on the dirt below. The shaman laughed and suddenly shouted once more. At his command, all the bats took off from their perches and darted around the cavern. I ducked and dodged their attacks and glanced back toward the ledge, but... The shaman was gone. The bats started hitting me then, and I figured the smell of the blood was exciting them. So I ran from the cave. Once outside, I got lost. Clouds hid the sky so I couldn't find my direction. I guess I was weaker from blood loss than I thought. I must have passed out somewhere and someone found me. Next thing I knew, I was here. James gasped and lay back on his pillow once more. That is, except for the dreams. God, what incredible dreams I've had. He managed a small smile, but a grimace quickly replaced his grin, and his eyes clenched shut with a shudder of pain. Soon his whole body shook. I looked to Dr. Wilkes. Is this because of his fever? I asked. Yes, she said, hurrying over as she reached a bedside table and removed the syringe from one of its drawers. He's not shivering, though. He's having another seizure. The convulsions are caused by the prolonged fever. His brain is starting to die from the high temperature. As she filled the syringe with a vial from the cabinet above the table, I backed away from the bed and asked, What are you giving him? It's my telotoxin, the doctor answered as she injected a yellowish liquid into his upper arm. It's a muscle relaxer similar to curare. It'll stop his spasms before he hurts himself. A nurse arrived and assisted. Together, the doctor and the nurse held James down, as his convulsions steadily grew more intense. Finally, the doctor reached over to the nearby table and picked up a leather strip, which she had placed between James' teeth. As the two of them held Jimmy down, she said, I'm sorry, Dr. Crawford, you'd best wait outside. I'll call you when he's resting again. Backing out into the hall, I took a seat in a nearby chair and waited in silence, wondering what to do. Hopefully just being there would give James strength, but I was worried that I was already too late. 
After a short time, I tried something I hadn't done since my grandmother's funeral many years before. I closed my eyes and prayed. Sometime during the night, I fell asleep. About dawn, an attendant rolled a cart full of food past me, and the rattling plates and glasses woke me. I stood, rubbed sleep from my eyes, and looked around. Dr. Wilkes was working behind the nurse's station, filling out paperwork. She smiled as she noticed me. Did you have a nice sleep, Dr. Crawford? Uh, I guess so, I said, stretching. How long was I out? She glanced at her watch. About three hours. Has there been any change? I asked. His temperature has begun to drop, and he's resting more peacefully, but he's not out of danger yet. She put down her pen and turned toward me. Her eyes bore the weariness of a long night shift. Why don't you go back to your hotel, she suggested. You've got to be exhausted, and you won't help your brother by killing yourself. Leave your number with admissions downstairs, and we'll call if there's a change in his condition. She added, I'm going to be leaving myself as soon as I turn over these charts to the day shift attending physician. I nodded and slowly picked up my bag. I didn't remember it being so heavy. The light from the sunrise which glared through the windows was painfully bright, and I squinted at its many reflections off the shiny chrome all around the room. A tiny bell announced the arrival of the elevator, and the doors drew back inviting me to leave. At the admissions desk, the clerk gave me directions to a nearby hotel. I found it and checked in, unpacked, and ordered food from room service. While I waited for my meal, I took a badly needed shower and shaved. Then, when the food finally arrived, I ate, hardly noticing the food. Afterwards, I called the hospital and left my phone number with admissions. Lastly, I called the States to tell my wife that I'd arrived safely. With some difficulty, I told her about James' condition. By the time I finished, it was nearly 10 a.m. local time, and I chose to lie down for a short nap. I fell asleep almost immediately and slept without dreams, until the phone woke me. As I woke, the unfamiliar surroundings left me confused and disoriented. It took a moment to remember where I was. As I lifted the phone off the cradle, I noticed the clock on the nightstand by the bed. It read 9 p.m. I'd lost the whole day due to jet lag. Hello, I said. Dr. Crawford, asked a familiar voice. This is Dr. Wilkes. I'm calling to let you know there's been a change in your brother's condition. I held my breath, half expecting the worst news. His fever's broken, she continued, and he's awake and lucid. I think he's beaten the infection and he's going to make it. A wave of relief washed over me. You sure? I asked as all weariness vanished. Could I, can I come over now? I asked, realizing I'd missed normal visiting hours once again. Sure, she replied. I'll tell the admissions clerk to let you write up. I just got back on duty myself, and I'll meet you here. Thanks, I said and hung up. Then I hurriedly changed my clothes and drove back to the hospital. As I entered James' room, I found him sitting upright, eating hospital food as fast as he could shovel it into his mouth. He paused and looked up at me with wonder and surprise and greeted me with his mouth full of food. Rob! he shouted with a broad smile, spreading across his face. Swallowing awkwardly, he said, For God's sake, I thought you were part of my dreams. I'm glad you're back. Did you really come all the way from New York just for me? I sure did, Jimmy. I was grinning so hard my cheeks hurt, and I hurried over to him to give him a gentle hug. His response, however, was anything but gentle. His bear hug took my breath away, and he pounded me on the back as he told me what a good big brother I was. When he finally released me, I took a seat beside him as he resumed his meal. The sound of the knock behind me made me turn, and I discovered Dr. Wilkes standing in the doorway. Quite a spectacular recovery, wouldn't you say, Dr. Crawford? Uh, yes, I'm amazed, I said. I take it this isn't usual. By no means, she said. I'm told he woke up about an hour before my shift, complaining only about acute hunger. She gestured at his unhindered display of eating. You should know that this is his third full meal since he woke, she grinned. 
I told him to take it easy for a few days and recommended a bland diet, but after he inhaled what I ordered and claimed he was still starving, I let him have whatever he wanted. While he ate, I examined James more closely. His eyes were clear without any sign of redness. While he was thin, as one would expect after days of fever, his color was excellent, and if his appetite was any indication, he was well on his way back to normal health. If you don't mind, James, said Dr. Wilkes, I just want to take your vitals for my charts. Then I'll leave you two alone. James continued to eat while Dr. Wilkes took his pulse and blood pressure. She also took a vial of blood for tests. As he finished the last of his meal, Dr. Wilkes was barely able to stick a thermometer in his mouth. Jimmy sat silently and obediently, grinning like a Cheshire cat, until she took it out and read it. 37 Celsius, she announced. Perfect. James spread his arms comically as if expecting a claim and said, Well, there you go. Would you expect anything else of your little brother? Dr. Wilkes shook her head in disbelief and left the room. James pushed the empty food cart away, settled back on his bed, and crossed his arms behind his head. His steel-gray eyes focused sharply at me. So you remember me being here last night? I asked. Absolutely, Rob. I remember every word. Well, I wasn't sure. You seemed a bit out of it. True, he said. I wasn't at my best, but I'm back and better than ever. So, I asked, can you remember what happened? He blinked. Of course, but I told you all that last night. Jimmy, last night you were delirious. You ranted on about magic shamans, immortals, and man-eating bats. James laughed in a thunderous roar that reminded me of his high school football days when he tried to outfight and outparty everyone around him. Well, then you weren't listening to me, bucko. I grimaced. He knew I hated it when he called me by that nickname. What I told you was I found the ancient shaman Wurumwadu, and he gave me the secret to Chikorpa, dream time. No, I replied, you told me you were searching for the Australian fountain of youth but got stabbed by a short aborigine with a sharp tick instead and nearly died of blood loss and infection. James' gaze didn't falter, but neither did his smile. If anything, he looked condescending. This was the way it always is with little brothers, I thought. They never do anything straightforward. Everything's always a contest of some sort. After a few seconds of silent staring, James said, I guess that's how you would interpret it, Rob, but he was Wurumwadu, and he did give me what I sought. What? I said, guffawing at him. You actually believe you met a thousand-year-old shaman with a secret to immortality? James smiled, nodding slowly. Now I was worried. Come on, Jimmy. Don't play with me this way. I know your fever was awfully high for a long time but don't go bonkers on me. I'm not, Rob, he replied with uncharacteristic seriousness. Come here, I'll prove it. He reached over and started peeling the surgical tape to the bandage on his left arm. Oh, don't do that, Jimmy, I said. You'll just get it infected. You have to give it time to heal. Give what time to heal? He asked innocently, and he lifted off the gauze. I stared at his arm, stunned. While the inside of the bandage was red and bloody, there was no mark of an injury on his arm at all, not even a scar. I approached and examined his arm where the horrific wound had been the night before. At first I touched gently, and then I poked and prodded. There wasn't even a mark or blemish where the cut had been. I clearly remembered the brachioradialis muscle split and exposed to almost the bone, the full length of his forearm. No, Rob, you're not going crazy. You did see it. It was an awful wound and it almost killed me. But, but how? I stammered. I healed it. I didn't know I could at first, but my dreams kept showing me how. Unfortunately, I was fighting the dreams and almost died. I guess I had to get weak enough that I couldn't resist them anymore. And when I finally accepted the dreams, I learned what Wurumwadu gave me and how to use it. And then I healed myself and woke up. What do you mean? What did he give you? 
James sighed deeply once. Rob, you remember the story I told you last night about how the shaman cut himself and then me? You recall how he grabbed me by the arm with his wounded hand? I nodded mutely. What he gave me was his blood, or rather what was in it. He cut us both so his blood would mingle with mine. His blood? Yes, listen. It's hard to explain since not all of the things in the dreams translate well into words, but you're a doctor, so I'll try to put them in terms you'll understand. Consider the human genome. It changes over time. In some ways it evolves, in others it diverges. Over generations, the genetic code decays. No, I said, interrupting. There's no evidence that evolution has stopped. It's carried us quite far along. Who's to say it's not still advancing the species? James glared. Rob, I don't want to argue. Just listen, or I won't bother with explanations at all. Look, the Aborigines descended from people who were actually quite advanced. They learned that the human genome was incomplete and, well, they figured out how to finish it and make man into what he needed to become or what he was once, long, long ago. I'm still not sure which. In any event, a component of the shaman's blood contained missing pieces of DNA that we don't have anymore. It activates a lot of those gene sequences your fellow scientists claim aren't used anymore. The only reason they're inactive is that man's DNA has degraded over millennia. Entropy has corrupted the genetic design so much that some essential pieces are missing, leaving other sections inactive. Whatever was in the shaman's blood mixed with mine and infected me. I almost died, but the virus, or agent, or long-chain protein fragments altered selective pieces of my own DNA and, well, they changed me. I frowned and glared. That's impossible, I said. Hey, bucko, I'm living proof. It is possible. I gritted my teeth involuntarily until I realized he was doing it deliberately again. Look, he said. Life is special in this universe, where the rest of reality is subject to entropy so that everything runs down and decays. Life renews and opposes entropy and the death of the entire universe. Life is, by its nature, negentropic. Yeah, I said. So, and where do you get off throwing all this scientific jargon around? One thing I had never received before was a science lecture from my kid brother. After all, I was the one who'd gone through college. He'd dropped out after only one semester and gone off to party for the rest of his life. This is what I learned from my dreams. It's what Wurumwadu was trying to tell me while I was sick. Think, Rob, he said now, seemingly sincere. What does negative entropy really mean? While everything else in the universe gradually decays from order to disorder, life creates order from chaos. It reverses the flow of the whole universe, in every cell of everything that lives. So, I asked again, what of it? This negative entropy, as you call it, is localized. The universe will still die anyway, and what does all this have to do with your miraculous recovery? James nodded. What Wurumwadu gave me was the missing piece of the human genome that we need to become what we were meant to be. Most life barely generates enough negative entropy to replicate itself. However, the more complex life is, the stronger the negative entropy it generates. That's why higher life forms live longer. Most people's damaged DNA, however, doesn't enable them to be fully negentropic. What negative entropy human cells do create is insufficient, and they eventually decay over time. People grow old, age, and die. What I've been given fixes the genetic code and allows me to do more, far more. I squinted at James, suddenly suspicious. What? You have more tricks than miracle healing? Spontaneous remission and tissue generation aside, I was now worried that James' mind was seriously affected. Oh, yes, replied James. If I understand it correctly, I've gained much more than mere control over my body. What do you mean? I asked stalling for time and hoping that Dr. Wilkes would return. Well, James said, it's not completely clear, though Wurumwadu tried to explain it to me. You see, 
fully negentropic life forms aren't bound by some of the seemingly immutable laws of physics. That's what the Aborigines mean by dream time. Such beings can exist outside the normal flow of time and travel against that flow, if they want. Beings enabled with this missing fragment of the human genome can effectively alter the flow of time. That's what reversing entropy ultimately means, reversing the flow of the universe. If I want, I could grow younger, or go forward, or back in time. So, you're some kind of god or superman now, I asked. Well, he said, chuckling, I guess so. Though it's really not being superhuman, it's what being human was truly intended to mean. You mean, man was made this way? Are you turning into a creationist now? I asked. For the first time, James paused and looked puzzled. That's a good question, he said. That's something Wurumwadu didn't explain. I guess I'll need to go check that out. And with that, he yanked the IV out of his arm, threw back the bedsheets, and jumped out of bed. I started to panic and headed for the door. James, however, simply gestured with his hand, and the door to the room slammed itself shut. I grabbed the handle and tugged on it, but it wouldn't budge. Oh, for God's sake, stop, said James. Leave the damn door alone and help me find my clothes. Dumbfounded, I stood looking at him blankly for a few seconds. James, however, said, Ah, they don't have them here. They must have removed them at the Cooper Pedy. Well, I should be able to go get them, and... He stopped again and thought for a moment. Come to think of it, they wouldn't be in very good shape. I do recall smearing them with guano and bleeding all over them. Then an odd grin appeared on his face. Well, I might as well give it a try sooner or later. He winked at me and said, be patient, Rob. I'll be right back. He squinted his eyes and clenched his fists, and for a moment nothing happened. And then, before I could say anything, his image shimmered and a bright glow appeared around him. And with a soundless flash of light, he vanished. I blinked and rubbed my eyes. Getting down on my hands and knees, I looked under the hospital bed. Returning to the door, I tugged on it, but it was still jammed. There was another silent explosion of light, and I heard a familiar chuckle behind me. I turned to find James standing in a pressed linen suit with a matching wide-brim hat and glossy black band. His outfit was off-white, somewhere between a soft cream and a light beige. Somehow, he seemed far healthier than a moment before and seemed to have gained some bulk. He no longer appeared gaunt, and he had a deep tan. In his hand, he held a long, dark wooden cane with a large, ornately engraved gold knob on its end. Smiling, he posed in a motionless swagger. So, what do you think? He prompted. I was speechless. Wrestling to collect my wits, I finally managed an inarticulate, Where did you get those? Pirouetting slowly, he said, These? and then lowered his arms and struck a pose as he thumbed his hat. 1852 Brisbane on the Gold Coast. It took me a while to figure it out, but time sliding is actually pretty easy once you get the hang of it. To be honest, I've been gone several subjective months since I left you here. When I first shifted away from here, I really did intend to return right away, but then I realized I had all the time in the world and could return to this instant whenever I wished. Still... I knew you'd be distressed, so I brought you a gift. Reaching into his coat pocket, he pulled out a flask. It was the size of a small flask that would contain alcohol. It was made of green glass and had an ornate silver stopper. This is for you. It's a sample of my blood and contains what I received in that grotto in Kanchu Gorge. Analyze it, study it, but don't use it. I've learned that it will kill most people who try. If their DNA has degraded too far they'll die. That's why the shamans give it out so rarely. Oh, by the way, I found that there are other immortals besides shamans. Actually, there are quite a few of us dreamwalkers. Most of them, however, hang out in the remote past. I guess there are fewer people in those time periods to bother them. You see, dreamwalkers can go anywhere they want in dream time. Touching the brim of his hat, he winked and said, however, I like the Gold Coast 
especially back in the mid-1800s, always have. Interesting people, interesting times. I just stood there, staring at the vial in James's hand, wondering if it was really what he claimed it to be. Shaking the flask at me, he said, Go ahead, Rob, take it. It'll give you something to think about while I'm gone. You have a lot of work to do. Reaching out, I carefully took the glass tube. Examining it, I found it did in fact seem to contain about 20 or 30 cc's of fluid. While it might be blood, it looked black through the colored bottle. Then I realized what James had just said and sputtered, While you're gone? Wait, what do you mean? Where are you going? Back to Brisbane, 1852. One of these days, I'll have to take you there. You'd love it. Smiling, he tapped the rim of his hat with a gold knob on the end of his cane, and then he gestured with it across the room. The nearby door that had been stuck shut before slowly drifted open without a sound. Be good, bucko. I'll see you at Christmas. Winking, he vanished as quickly as popping a soap bubble. A single curl of mist like a warm breath on a cold day drifted up from the place where he had been standing a moment before, and then it faded and was gone as well. Looking about, I was quite unable to accept what had just happened. Then terror washed over me as I realized I had no credible way to explain his absence to Dr. Wilkes. As I stepped out into the hall, I wondered if I should try to explain what happened to her, even as I realized that they would think me mad. Remembering the vial in my hand, I stuffed it into a pocket and hurried down the elevator. By the time I reached the first floor of the hospital, I was already planning the initial tests I'd conduct on James's blood sample and began making a mental list of researchers that I could really trust. James was right. I did have a lot of work to do. Thank you for listening. We love our listeners, fans, and patrons. If you loved what you heard, please like and subscribe to our audio anthology and consider visiting our Patreon site at www.patreon.com forward slash Melissa Del Toro voiceover, which you can find listed in the show notes for this episode.